It's been 111 years since Titanic was launched at the Harlan and Wolf shipyard, and her fame is not decreasing in the least. I spent the last month watching countless videos about the top 10 facts regarding Titanic, and just a few moments ago read an enormous Facebook thread full of shocking Titanic truths that people were sharing. I am not sure that it is good anymore that Titanic is so popular, but to celebrate Titanic's 111th anniversary, I thought I should debunk, mainly with common sense, 10 Titanic truths that I thought were worth talking about. So let's dive right in. Number 1. Faulty Design Since Titanic sank after hitting an iceberg, can you believe that, an iceberg of all things? The design of the ship had to be poor, along with low-grade materials and poor construction methods. Let's break that down faster than Titanic breaking in two with shoddy steel. Without getting into specific historical facts, since I said I would try to debunk these facts with common sense, and I'm sure I'll fail, Titanic and her older sister ship were built side by side. I think that is at least common knowledge. Indeed, Titanic sank, but Olympic, constructed with the same steel, rivets, and design, survived a world war, several collisions, and over 20 years of service to receive the name Old Reliable. She was so strong and sturdy that even when being scrapped, she was noted as being in great shape. Just sadly, she was a gem of the past. After Titanic sinking, Olympic had additional lifeboats added, not Titanic's. Several watertight bulkheads were raised higher, and some lowered, and a new double hull was installed to add to the already long list of safety features. What many people argue would have prevented the sinking of Titanic is capping off the top of the watertight bulkheads like a battleship. Well, fantastic, then you would have a battleship and not an ocean liner. Good luck maneuvering around passengers, and I'll talk about that more in a bit. These ships are not designed to be indestructible. Like skyscrapers, ocean liners are designed to have safety features and not built like bunkers. We need to be able to live and breathe in them. Titanic featured many innovations to minimize any danger and damage she encountered, including a ship collision, ramming another vessel, or the worst case scenario that could be imagined. But what was not expected, including a war, was the sideswiping 300 feet long damage done by the iceberg. Sometimes in life, we can't possibly foresee something that will destroy us from ever happening. Number 2. Priority Space for First Class All too many of these clickbait facts have been gathered from movie lines. I'll defend the movies to death, but sometimes it gets frustrating to remind people that the films are not documentaries, as excellent as they can be. But it was thought by some that the deck would look too cluttered, <laughs> so I was overruled. Oh, Tommy boy -o. why did you say that? Now I have to go and kick you out of ours. It's okay, I can do an Irish accent, I did my genealogy, and I am part Irish. This line was taken as an absolute fact as to why Titanic had not enough boats and why so many people died. It even goes further, Titanic was initially going to have watertight bulkheads that extended up to her top decks, but for the sake of first class cabins or rooms being larger, the bulkheads were lowered. That line is one taken right from the musical. A few moments ago, I explained that Titanic's design was not as deficient as many might think, because it was her uber-successful sister ship's design. Titanic's bulkheads didn't go any higher than E-deck, but they could have gone a deck higher, up to D-deck, and many of them a few decks higher still, without cutting into first-class areas amidship. The best first-class cabins were on B and C decks, and when Olympic's bulkheads were raised, none of her first-class cabins, nor grand saloons, were affected by the change. The same for the third and safer sister ship built later, Britannic. Her watertight bulkheads went up high, but her cabins and first class rooms were in the same general areas as Titanic and Olympics, and were not drastically changed. One might argue Britannic was altered to be more modern for the era she would sail in, if not for World War I. But the point is, watertight bulkheads and doors on ocean liners were not uncommon in passenger areas, including first class during that time period. Sometimes it would cut into a passageway, other times a bulkhead would even divide up your saloon. It was just part of ship life. Now for lifeboats. Cluttering up the decks? Not so much. One needs to understand the Welland type davit that was used on Titanic. Welland davits allowed to have extra boats stored inboard of the boat already rigged to be deployed. In other words, instead of one lifeboat per set of davits, you could have up to two or three sets of boats. Which can take an extra row of boats inside this one. With all the lifeboats on Titanic placed on the promenade for second class and officers, except for four boats, would this have truly meant crowded and cluttered decks for the all-important first-class passengers? 
They even had their own partially enclosed promenade deck, one under the boat deck, to enjoy, free of boats. While Titanic didn't have enough boats for all passengers, she had more than enough required by law, even more than her sister ship Olympic, and what was initially designed for. But I'm not saying that that was okay. But it is absurd to say that the decision to have a certain number of boats was made with aesthetic intentions by one or two men in the White Star Line. A waste of deck space as it is in an unsinkable ship. Number three, a faulty ship captain. The captain of a ship is responsible for all passengers and crew. He is in command at the end of the day and the buck stops with him. And since Titanic was one of the worst disasters at sea, that must mean she had one of the worst captains of all time? Not so. But many like to point out that Captain E.J. Smith had a distinguished career of mishaps, particularly with Titanic's sister ship Olympic. Let's look at some of those. Olympic's propeller sucked in a tug in New York on her maiden voyage, slicing and severely damaging the smaller boat. The company which owned the tug rightfully sued White Star for damages, after Titanic sank, mind you, much later. However, the American court dismissed the lawsuit, blaming the tugboat, not Olympic at all, regardless who was in command of Olympic at the time, which was a pilot, not Captain Smith. A, a pilot? What, what, what's a pilot? Well, a pilot is an individual who comes aboard the ship and maneuvers the vessel through waters in which they have extensive knowledge. So on Olympic's bridge in New York Harbor, Smith would assist a pilot in bringing the larger vessel to her dock. And the same would occur in Southampton waters as Olympic was either leaving or entering England. And it is in Southampton waters when perhaps Smith's command of these large vessels comes most into question. As Olympic was sailing south on a voyage in September 1911, the cruiser HMS Hawk began sailing almost parallel to Olympic. Smith called out to the pilot aboard Olympic that Hawk was close and performing odd maneuvers, looking that she might hit Olympic's stern. But the pilot stated he needed confirmation she was going to hit before he would act. By the time Smith yelled out Hawk's bow was coming in, it was too late. No commands would have played out in time to change the course of the accident, much like Titanic's less than a year later. Only an official government naval inquiry was held, much to the anger of White Star Line, and thus blame for the accident was placed on Olympic. White Star Line sued the Admiralty, the government countersued, it was a real depth be heard of its day. But the final judgment laid blame on Olympic and her faulty navigation, but it was specifically the navigation by her pilot and going so dangerously near Hawk. Luckily for White Star, it was also determined that the ship and her crew listened to all the orders by the pilot properly, meaning they weren't technically to blame, thanks to an odd British law regarding pilots. A well, long story short, Captain Smith was not at the helm of Olympic during either of these accidents. And White Star Line held nothing against Captain Smith and trusted him with their best ships for sound reasons. And in April 1912, he used his decades of experience and the accepted standards of ocean liner navigation to command his new ship, a ship he put much faith in to be strong and technologically advanced. He called it unsinkable. Unfortunately for Smith, there were many unexpected factors that would bring forth the disaster. Seems like it's not easy to pin the disaster on just one person or facet. Number 4. Unsinkable Titanic. A waste of deck space as it is in an unsinkable ship. Titanic was called unsinkable all the time, but a more modern understanding is that that only started to be true after the disaster. Kind of a poetic post-sinking deal to make the story much more tragic. The truth is stranger than fiction in this case. White Star Line publicity materials were released before Titanic or Olympic were even finished and claimed the ships were designed to be unsinkable, so we can blame the company for this one. Indeed, Shipbuilder Magazine is famous for calling these vessels practically unsinkable in one of its issues. Still, the phrase unsinkable became so common with these ships that even Captain Smith was fond of calling his ship unsinkable. But it wasn't the first ship to be considered so safe it was unsinkable. With more modern technology added to these ships, the more confident humanity was getting. Number 5. Missing Binoculars and Missing Keys We keep looking for that one key that could change history, don't we? So the story goes that David Blair was intended to be the second officer, but things changed when Captain Smith wanted Chief Officer Wilde from Olympic, because it was Titanic's maiden voyage, and he needed that familiar face aboard. So when Wilde came, Murdoch and Lightteller, Chief and First Officer at the time, were bumped down a peg, and Blair was kicked off the boat. Blair leaves with him the apparent only one key to the binocular box. Or so I read. Regardless of why Blair might have had the only one key with him, the lookouts had no binoculars. So I will ask you, gentle viewers, have you ever used a pair of binoculars before? You put them up to your eyes and you can see objects far away up close. Magic, refraction, lenses. 
but you can't see everything that you could before. You have to move the glasses around. You can only see things in a specific field of view. Binoculars are intended to spot and identify objects, while the men in the crow's nest use their whole vision to pan and look for danger with a broader perspective. There was a good argument that if one of the two lookouts had some binoculars and looked dead ahead, he could have spotted the bird. Or if one had spotted the haze and used the binoculars right away, they could have seen the iceberg. But to say the ship was doomed without them having the binoculars is a little misleading. There are too many factors that lead up to the disaster, including... Number 6. Ignoring ice warnings and first class first. Titanic's two wireless operators, Phillips and Bride, were not part of the official crew but worked for the Marconi company. Therefore, they prioritized passenger messages which brought in profit and ignored all incoming warnings of ice and weather. <sighs> oh boy, does, does that make sense at all? Can you picture Mr. Guglielmo Marconi telling his workers, Hey, uh, wireless men, I want you to make all the money. Don't worry about the icebergs. Don't worry about the fog. Just make a money, mamma mia. No, it's okay. I can be Italian too. I did my genealogy and I'm part Italian, see? No. So if you own a big tech company and send members of your workforce out on a third-party ship with company property that is being paid for on a loan, of course, you can instruct your workers to disregard their own safety when they get informed about potential danger? Well, weather reports in the daily news were part of the reports given to the passengers on the ship's bulletin boards, so it was beneficial for the wireless men to take note of those when they came in, but still, it wasn't always just about making money, but protecting their investment and safety. Perhaps it came down to the men working the wireless to decide what had the most priority? Sending the backlog of messages, or making sure that that sixth ice warning got to the bridge of the unsinkable ship? Number 7. Crew Trapped Below Without a doubt, some brave members of Titanic's crew stayed at their posts as long as possible to keep the power running for the evacuation. But one notion that is accepted as fact sometimes is that the crew were either stuck below or trapped below. Those mechanical waterhead doors closing sealed your fate if you didn't get through fast enough. Those guys have to run as quick as possible to get through at the last possible second. But if you recall correctly, Titanic's waterhead compartments were not sealed at the top. If the doors are shut, you aren't trapped. You can take an emergency ladder, or staircase, up and out to the top, like this one right here on the movie! I don't know why they did all this. To add drama and suspense to a scene that's already full of drama and suspense? By most accounts, Titanic's hero engineers, who did stay below as long as possible and who all did perish, didn't meet their fates trapped in the engine room, but left when it got serious near the end. Number 8. Break Up Underwater a popular documentary on Titanic claims that due to new evidence, it's always new evidence, isn't it? Titanic broke apart as she descended to the bottom of the seafloor, far from survivors' visions and the water's surface. It seems like a good theory. The two official inquiries made it clear through survivor testimony that Titanic sank intact. But just because the inquiries made a decision doesn't mean it is a fact. We all know that Titanic is broken and her debris field is massive. I have said on some videos before to take survival testimony with a grain of salt, so you might think that I am contradicting myself, but hear me out. At a minimum, around 120 accounts from newspapers, letters, diaries, and anecdotes of survivors are stating that the ship broke apart while sinking at the surface. Some of these accounts are very sound and reasonable. Passengers in Lifeboat 4, one of the last to leave Titanic and very close to the ship as she sank, were primarily filled with elite first class ladies, and some of their accounts of the breakup, which they would have had front row seats to, include feeling the shockwaves of the ship collapsing and tearing apart as they were that close. So why would a documentary, which interviewed historians and researchers, make such a colossal error? As someone who has been in a few of these documentaries and spoken to many historians about it, let me leave you with an excellent old fashioned fashion expression. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Documentaries and movies and productions come together in the editing room, and no matter how many facts and stories you give to the crew, the director and editor will use what is best for the narrative of their story. Happens for documentaries too. Number 9. Racism on Titanic. This is a tough one that I've desired to address, but I'm not sure how. Luckily I did my genealogy, and I am totally the man for the job to talk about racism. But in seriousness, it is a topic that not all Titanic historians wish to address. I have even been told by some older ones that they do not like to bring up examples that they have read about. But I will try to explain this subject as best I can as a white Titanic historian. I often see a post claiming black people or anyone of color were not allowed on Titanic, or perhaps worse still, that they were only allowed aboard as cargo. 
Kyle Hudak, fellow Titanic historian and THG snowballer, has debunked this in a rather enlightening Tumblr post, which I'll link below. I'll focus on Titanic and the facts. There were people of color and diversity aboard Titanic. There were black people aboard Titanic. But did they encounter equality aboard? Joseph LaRoche, who I would argue was the most famous second-class male passenger after Lawrence Beasley, was traveling from his home in France, heading back to Haiti where he was born with his family. Due to the racism he encountered in France, there were fewer job opportunities. A letter written by his wife, Juliette, on Titanic to her father seems to paint a picture of harmony between passengers and their family, stating, People on board are very nice. This doesn't mean that Titanic was a perfect ship full of harmonized passengers with zero racism. It might not have been outwardly displayed aboard Titanic, such as in the American South before civil rights or Nazi Germany, yet racism was embedded in some passengers' psyche. A passing comment about hoping not to sit next to a Jewish passenger at dinner. Providing testimony at the inquiry about how your gunshots were to keep Italian immigrants from entering your lifeboat or writing a letter to your parents, and innocently describing Joseph LaRoche's two young daughters as the finest little Japanese baby girls who look like dolls running about. These remarks were made by, in their standards of the day, educated and respected white individuals aboard Titanic. And unfortunately, like much racism in history, it is there if you look for it and invisible if you want to ignore it. If anything, it brings more depth to the passengers and crew of Titanic, I believe. These men and women were imperfect, flawed, and human, part of their world, which was just as imperfect and flawed as today. Yet after the sinking, the struggle for some would be even more challenging due to this world. Once the news of six surviving Chinese passengers made its way to the press, it was manipulated that they were not passengers at all, but stowaways. They snuck aboard Titanic and were hiding in lifeboats from the get-go. Papers reported that aboard Carpathia, the crew was considering throwing them overboard with iron shackles to weigh them down. Humanity is flawed, and until we can accept that concepts such as racism have always been present in our history, we cannot make progress. Number 10. Automatic flushing toilets. I wanted to end on a lighter note. My very first Titanic University video was about Titanic's toilets and counting all of them. While I don't feel like going back and watching it, I've read a lot lately that people think Titanic's third class had automatic flushing toilets to make sure the ignorant and poor immigrants didn't leave their business unattended. <sighs> and I have a weird feeling that I said that somewhere, so I want to amend it and say that no, they didn't have toilets that automatically flushed. Their toilets were designed just like the rest of Titanic's with a lever on the side that required you to pull it up to flush. They weren't that fancy, and third-class passengers weren't that unsophisticated that they weren't shown how or known how to flush a toilet. However, they still only had two bathtubs. But hey, I don't even have one bathtub. For Titanic Honor and Glory and Titanic University, I'm Matthew DeWinkler. Thanks for watching.